It's 3 o'clock. I call the Planning Commission work session meeting of Tuesday, June 7th to order. Looks like everyone's here, but can we have a roll call, please? Chairman Loring? Here. Commissioner Tagnese? Here. Commissioner Pfeiffer? Here. Commissioner Burnett? Here. Commissioner Mayfield? Here. Commissioner Ray? Here. Commissioner Richardson? Here. Or Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you. Do you have any uh, anything before we jump into the agenda? Uh, no. Okay. We're going to uh, review the regular meeting agenda first, and we're just going to jump into RZ-22-379, an ordinance conditionally rezone approximately 10.9 acres of land at 525, 527, 529, 531, 532, 534, 536, 540, 544, 546, 554, and 700 Fairmont Avenue, and 205, 209, and 213 Wick Street, and 563 North Braddock Street. From limited industrial element one district with some portions having Carter Enhancement Overlay, CE Overlay, to high-density residential district, Plan unit development overlay with some portions having a car enhancement overlay. Mr. Humans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the commission uh, have with me John Margolin. Margolin. A gasoline, as he said. Um, and he is filling in for Anthony, uh, who is the architect on the project, who's actually uh, out of the country. And then I'll also have David Frank, uh, who's representing the application on behalf of Pannoni, and Matt Akers. Uh, uh, Council for the applicant. Uh, and so the commission may have questions that uh, will be better answered by them uh, instead of uh, either of us here at the front table. Um, this uh, zoning ordinance title is a mouthful. Um, that's mainly because yes. there are multiple parcels associated with the uh, site that's being proposed. And as I noted in the staff report, it's kind of unusual in that this is a uh, uh, a PUD that straddles two existing streets. Um, it's uh, situated along both sides of Fairmont Avenue, north of the uh, residential uh, area there, extending from Old Town, and then also uh, includes city-owned property on the north side of Wick Street. So uh, straddling uh, both of those, and it will entail um, reconstruction of West Wick Street in a partnership approach um, with the city that also includes some major stormwater uh, management improvements and we'll get into that in a minute um, but on the screen there you can see the uh, on the left um, kind of the gray late gray um, shaded properties those are the ones and uh, if you look closely you can see the uh, location of the existing former um, headquarters for national food product company uh, currently being utilized as a place of worship there are other structures on the property including a uh, residential dwelling on the southernmost uh, parcel that is along the um, east side of Fairmont Avenue. Uh, and then there are some industrial uh, structures, particularly on the west side of Fairmont Avenue, backed up to the uh, former railroad in that location. So uh, let me interrupt you just for a moment. Sure. Great to see a big crowd. This is our work session, so we will just take a lot of information in. We're not, it's not going to be a public hearing, so we generally won't ask for input from uh, the audience but if you've got something permanent uh, pertinent to the subject we may ask you to answer a question thank you good yep appreciate that so um, the other graphic here uh, outlines all of the uh, it's actually 17 parcels of land uh, thus the very long uh, um, title for this ordinance to rezone multiple properties uh, some of them Majority of them have addresses on Fairmont Avenue, but there's also the city-owned parcel that's uh, on the north side of Wick, uh, east of uh, uh, Fairmont Avenue. Uh, and by the way, the configuration of that parcel that's depicted there, um, <coughs> don't be misled, that, that larger triangle area is the parcel, it's just uh, uh, not represented well on our city GIS. So it, it doesn't really um, look exactly like what's shown there. It's the, Kind of everything between the railroad and Fairmont Avenue there. Um, there are also a couple of the properties that front only on um, West Wick Street, and then the one uh, undeveloped property there with a little pipe stem coming out to uh, Braddock Street. Um, that one has a uh, North Braddock Street address, even though there's no uh, uh, buildings on that portion. So all of these are under the ownership of the Fairmont uh, uh, LLC. 
um, except for the uh, city-owned parcel at 700 uh, Fairmont Avenue. The uh, rezoning, uh, kind of unusual when David put this together, I, I was kind of asking them, uh, you know, is this right? Because we're used to seeing the, the red uh, B2 district somewhere uh, showing up, but there is no highway commercial in this area of the city. Um, all of the property that is uh, subject to the rezoning is currently zoned uh, M1. There is that little finger of, uh, uh, of HR zone property coming out to North Braddock Street. Um, and the proposal would be to take all of the M1 limited industrial zoning property and uh, have that change to this uh, HR underlying zoning with uh, the PUD, Plan Unit Development Overlay, to support uh, this mixed use PUD with uh, 262 dwelling units, uh, some of them multifamily, some of them townhouse uh, styled, and some of them actually uh, proposed for platting out as individual lots. Um, and then commercial uh, development also in two buildings uh, up near where um, the uh, Fairmont Avenue intersects with West Wick Street. The other thing that stays in place, and it's hard to see on this graphic, is the quarter enhancement overlay district. Um, that is the Fairmont Avenue overlay district, and it includes all the properties that physically front on uh, Fairmont Avenue. So everything that's on the west side there, that wedge uh, that you see in between Fairmont and the railroad, uh, and then generally following those frontage properties, but there's uh, some irregular boundary of the, of the overlay district to include some of the uh, uh, land that fronts only on uh, West Wick Street. Likewise, the city-owned parcel uh, that is in the Fairmont Avenue corridor in the district as well. Um, the third overlay uh, that's represented here is the proposed uh, conditional zone. So we have the uh, the existing uh, M1 changing to HR, uh, high density residential on the underlying level, but then there's three overlay districts, uh, PUD, quarter enhancement, and uh, conditional zoning. And the conditional zoning reflects the fact that there have been proffers voluntarily uh, submitted uh, to uh, mitigate some of the impacts that are directly attributable to the request to rezone this from uh, the industrial zoning to the zoning that allows for the mixed use and, and fairly high uh, intensity of uh, residential use. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to John here now uh, to give you a, a background on uh, what the concept was and uh, more specifics in terms of the development proposal. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the Neighborhood Conceptual Master Plan endeavors to emulate the best traditions of historic Winchester in the creation of a new neighborhood fabric that contributes positively to the growth of the city. Instead of one large apartment building surrounded by parking lots, the plan will create a new community that is an extension of the residential neighborhood of Winchester. <coughs> Winchester excuse me. <coughs> the plan includes townhouses, mid-scale apartment buildings, a neighborhood restaurant and retail catalyst, and a series of well-defined community spaces connected by paths and sidewalks. The plan is anchored by a large green and pavilion, which will be the central gathering space for the neighborhood. Around the space are a series of traditional streetscapes with four-story structures reinforcing key views to the site. The buildings define public spaces that encourage pedestrian activity and the mix of building sizes and types create the variety of differences in scale typical of historic Winchester. talk about the, uh, the project a little bit more, Again, this is a, uh, it's a designated redevelopment site and the, the, from, in the comprehensive plan and uh, neighborhood revitalization is kind of the idea. So the key here uh, that we feel is, is it's not really a project, it's a neighborhood. Uh, you know, we don't want to just put in high density residential. Uh, we, we're trying to make it a, a big a mix of uses with townhouses and apartments. Uh, what you can see with the plans um, and, and I was going to get to the, the, the setbacks, but uh, I can talk about the setbacks with this picture probably a little bit better. Uh, the front yard setbacks, as you can see on Braddock Street, 
uh, which is the upper right corner. The uh, yeah, from well, I can play around that. So up here we have Braddock Street, um, a couple of units there. Then along the Wick we have units fronting, and then also we're we're creating a uh, streetscape along Fairmont Avenue. Part of the design here is to make uh, the streets uh, make it feel like a neighborhood street. Uh, right now it's M1 zoned. It's open. Uh, you know we're trying to reclaim this land to be part of this neighborhood. Um, and in doing so, we're having 10-foot front yard setbacks. We're bringing the units up. Uh, the, you know, all the units are front facing and all of the uh, access, the driveway access uh, from the garages are gonna be in the rear. So you'll have a front door, the units will have a street presence, and we have 10-foot uh, setbacks along the front. Uh, along the, the, the sides, uh, along Braddock Street, we're proposing uh, a 25 foot setback um, and then we have I believe a 75 foot setback on the apartments uh, and uh, 30 feet we're showing uh, for the M M1 use uh, up along Fairmont so in essence with the setbacks using the PUD overlay uh, we're, we're trying to stay consistent with some some published uh, HR guidelines uh, but also we're, we're taking a look at how this development can be laid out uh, to be a little bit more of a traditional neighborhood and not just an apartment project. And these are the, the setbacks that we're, we're proposing. Just, okay. uh, open space. So uh, another, uh, this goes back also to the comp plan and what the city's trying to achieve. Uh, we are very respectful of a couple of things. One is the uh, uh, public improvements project there's going to be a stormwater facility on the north side of Wick Street. Uh, another, another item uh, is the, the, there has been a desire in the past, and I think there still is, to realign Wick Street so it matches up in a better grid format uh, across from Struther Lane. Um, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Um, yeah. Um, so, and it's at the top of the page. So, so in Staying in line with the uh, objectives that the city stated and you know, the project would like to see as well. Uh, we've, we've come up with a plan in which we realign, maybe we don't plan yet, where we realign um, Wick Street, West Wick Street with Struthers Lane, and then also we understand that we're impacting uh, future stormwater management plans. Um, so our open space calculations uh, include the stormwater area to the north and south of Wick, and then also uh, the open space, or green space, I should say, areas um, throughout the rest of the development. Um, John will probably talk a little bit more about the layout and design of those as we get further along, but essentially the, uh, the project will meet the 45% green space requirement. Uh, right now we are you know, right around the 45%. We understand that in final engineering, uh, it's not entirely under our control. Uh, we're talking with city staff uh, on stormwater management design. That project's underway. Uh, we're going to work very closely with city staff on also the realignment of WIC and the requirements that the city would like to see in terms of uh, uh, on-street parking and uh, lane widths and curb and gutter. Um, so as we work through the final design, should there be a need for additional green space, we have opportunities such as green roofs or potentially doing some uh, green, green space improvements along uh, Fairmont Braddock or Wick Street somewhere off-site. Uh, so the intent here is to completely meet the 45% green space with this, with this project. Uh, but again, we're gonna, we may have to get creative with final engineering, working with city planning and city engineering. Uh, residential density. So uh, right now the project is proposing the 262 units um, as, as demonstrated here with uh, uh, 92 townhouses and 170 apartments. Uh, all but 13 of the units are either one or two bedroom. Um, and the density bonuses that we're, we're achieving are for, uh, with the affordable housing uh, bonus, elevator bonus, transit bonus, and community amenities bonus. Um, briefly, I can talk to um, the affordable housing. We are going to commit to 5% of the dwelling units being affordable, pretty standard in the ordinance. Um, and Is that any Five per, five percent, yes, sir. Uh, five percent of the units will be will be designated as affordable. Um, 
and we're going to take uh, we're going to have uh, ele elevators um, for the accessibility reasons. Uh, transit, we have an additional uh, uh, additional bus stop proposed. That would be that would be located in front of the uh, retail area where you see that star. Um, and then also we are taking advantage of community amenities, which would be the bus stop, bike share, which we will work with city planning and other folks as to what bike share uh, institutions <laughs> they, they will be using, um, and then vehicle charging stations. Uh, something to point out as well uh, is with the architecture, you might see here underneath, uh, facing the parking lot side, there's going to be pull-in parking. So in other words, on the back side of these units, there'll be uh, parking below the building on the on the rear, and that is a very easy opportunity for charging stations. Uh, so uh, again, final locations, all that is going to really be determined uh, when we do the, the site plan and then do final design. Is that the last one? Uh, and then parking. So uh, the parking, uh, essentially what we have with the project is uh, the, the mix of uses. Uh, the garage, uh, sorry, the townhouse units park themselves. They have garages. Uh, they all have two-car garages. Uh, some units actually have driveways in front of them as well. And the parking has been laid out so that at each of the apartment buildings, there is not only the underground uh, sorry, ground floor parking uh, that I mentioned, but there's also parking lots distributed around both the retail and the, uh, the, the apartment buildings. Again, we're trying to keep as much of that parking uh, behind buildings. So again, this is a, has a neighborhood feel. We want, we want the, 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 the streets, the circulation, the sidewalks that people go around uh, Fairmont, Braddock, and Wick. That they see, that they see neighborhood, not parking lots. Uh, so that's a, a key part of the design uh, that, that you see before you today. Um, the parking uh, along the streets. So we're proposing on-street parking at Fairmont, uh, along Fairmont, and we believe we're going to end up with on-street parking with the realigned Wick. That is just again, that's low-hanging fruit. I believe the city would like to see that, and we would like to see it as well. So that, that'll be handled in final design. None of those on-street parking spaces were, were included in these tabulations, so there's additional on-street parking to serve uh, the community and, uh, and, and some of the retail components. Uh, yeah, so, so the, the required, the, the, the project-wide, we have 497 parking spaces, and the project-wide is required uh, of 333, uh, again, majority of those extra spaces are with the townhouse units because uh, we have the two car garages and, uh, and some driveways. So, um, so yeah, so for the development plan, I, uh, I've touched on, I've touched on a couple of these, a uh, couple of items already. Um, we've, we've, again, we've laid this project out uh, we've laid this project out in a fashion to, to, for it to be a neighborhood. Um, you know, the point is you know, to, 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 to be a part of the community, have interconnectivity, and have it feel like when this thing is built and occupied that neighbors from North Fairmont and Braddock Streets can easily walk down the street and pass through this property, uh, utilize the, the playground, the you know, open areas that we're, we're establishing, the plaza spaces, um, there's a gazebo that'll be, that'll be in place. Um, so the, as far as the development and plan is concerned, I'll focus some more on the, again, the stormwater management and Wick Street. Um, Wick Street is going to be realigned with the, uh, so, so Wick Street is gonna be realigned and you can see there's gonna be some, uh, a new right of way is gonna have to be established uh, for Wick Street again, we will work with uh, the Public Utilities Department to make sure that right away is, is is plenty adequate and you know what to their liking. Um, north of Wick Street will be the stormwater management facility. That facility will be entirely designed by the, uh, the city project that is currently underway. So we're gonna we're gonna be working with with Public Works uh, on that design for the outfall pipes. So this project is gonna commit to. Uh, Improving Wick Street and the storm sewer collection system, that's going to be the outfall along Wick Street, uh, along our frontage. 
uh, for the discharge of that storm water. Just below Wick Street is going to be a, a little bit of open space that's going to be um, essentially transitioned from Wick Street to part of uh, additional stormwater management. Uh, again, we're going to be working very closely with the Public Works on exactly how that is going to be utilized. Uh, that is capturing a lot of water from the from the west on the other side of the railroad tracks that's coming in and it's going to be rerouted along Fairmont into that facility so it'll have a detention component but uh, it's, it's it's been discussed uh, with public works and the city staff and you know our design team uh, this is a very functional necessary um, project for the city from stormwater management but everybody involved wants it to look nice when it's done and not just be a big stormwater so uh, again, when we go through to final engineering, there will be opportunities to, to make this look right and again, feel more, feel more like a neighborhood than a, than a public improvements project. Yep, uh, so, so uh, another item that you can see on the development plan on the uh, border with the residents on uh, Braddock Street and to the project south, uh, we, are, we, are, we are proposing uh, landscape screening. Uh, I'd also like to point out that we had a, a neighborhood meeting um, where we're, we had pretty good attendance. Uh, we presented this project to the system, everyone that came. But we had a we had a pretty good showing. Um, I believe it was north of 50 people. Um, so uh, one of the comments that we received at that time was from people on uh, Braddock Street uh, on the, the proximity of the project, and I guess really losing losing the trees that back corner of the property right now half the property is right now just a big stone stone pad the other property is just has been grown up over the years uh, and there's a sense of loss uh, from from the residents there so we have in turn since that meeting increased the uh, separation distance uh, moved the units a little bit further from the, the rear of those units from Braddock Street and we're also proposing to put additional screening along the south side and on the west side with our project. Another thing that we're talking about with the owner is uh, securing an arborist, uh, doing a study of the trees that are along that boundary with the residents in Bond along Braddock Street and doing a proper assessment of if there are trees there that could be saved that are advantageous to not only the folks on Braddock Street but also this, uh, this half of the neighborhood. Uh, we'll, we're, we're gonna take a look and see what, we can, what can be saved. Um, obviously not everything can be saved and obviously not every tree is of the same caliber Worth, but what we we intend to infill where we can with uh, with the screen along those those boundaries. Um, one of the items in your in your report um, I can address quickly is uh, the the tab, open space tabulations might not have been very clear. Uh, there was 3.1 acres proposed in the green space, and of that 3.1.31 acres is the areas shown. Um, so essentially there are areas in the project that will be uh, front yards, front facing, that will essentially be eased open space uh, between the front of the units and the, the streets, which are um, Wick Fairmont and Braddock. So uh, that 0.31 is part of the total, 3.81 acres. Uh, and I, I think the remainder is that Seven acres, which is the city track line or the But the bottom line at 10 is to meet the green space requirement. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's it's a it's a bit of a moving target, but it's it, you know it will be met. Um, I just noticed in the staff report there was there was some question as to it seemed that to Tim that the math wasn't working. Um, so I guess at this point we can talk. I guess Tim, I'll go off back of you. Thank you, David. Um, so, uh, as David's alluded to, this is going to be a partnership between the city uh, and the developer on parts of the project, including the stormwater, but also including uh, improvements that the city already had in the capital improvement program for West Wick Street, which we only, uh, I think, less than two years ago acquired uh, right away uh, ownership 
of that. That was actually owned by uh, the successor to Winchester Western. Um, now that we own that right away, we're underway with uh, design plans. And um, this project, uh, meaning the, the PUD, is uh, kind of forcing us to move ahead a little faster than we might otherwise have done, at least on the west, uh, uh, western portion of Wick Street. Um, so what happens uh, to the east, closer to Cameron Street there, uh, uh, east Wick Street between Loudoun and Cameron might uh, take longer than what will happen here. In the graphic at the bottom here, this is kind of zooming in where some of those townhouses are situated on either side of the, uh, the main entrance coming in from Wick Street there. There's also two entrances uh, on uh, Fairmont Avenue, but uh, this would be uh, an area where we'd be looking at road diet for West Wick Street. You know, today it's just kind of a uh, not well-defined uh, curvilinear uh, roadway that kind of wiggled its way around some industrial buildings and railroad rights of ways. Um, so most likely as you approach Fairmont Avenue, you're gonna have three lanes consisting of one eastbound and then two approaching uh, Fairmont Avenue and westbound movement. That allows for um, the northbound heading out into the county on US 522 to have a dedicated lane and then have uh, the southbound movement, the left turn coming into the city on Fairmont as well as a through movement because with the realignment, this will now be directly across from Struthers Lane uh, for uh, particularly for any truck traffic that might be accessing the um, uh, National Fruit uh, because they're, you're gonna have a continuing uh, industrial operation there. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping can happen is that uh, with these uh, townhouse units kind of creating more of a residential streetscape um, that we can um, in addition to what's depicted up here, having 12 foot wide lanes, and they may actually wind up uh, being 11 foot lanes uh, because that's a traffic calming measure um, to kind of slow down the traffic. Hopefully we can get um, more comfort uh, between the fronts of those units and the, the travel lanes by getting a bay of parking there along the south side. So uh, that's something. And of course they would be installing the, uh, the sidewalk south side of the uh, Wick Street there. So uh, I'm gonna turn it back over, I think, to John now to kind of run through some of the uh, elevations, uh, the pretty pictures, uh, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions. Um, briefly though, I'll jump back in on traffic. Uh, some of the uh, impacts we're mitigating on the traffic is, is as Tim said, we're, we're looking at traffic calming, we're looking at this being a neighborhood street. Uh, Wick Street improvements, we're going to work hand in glove with Public Works to make sure that those improvements are set up how the, the city wants those streets set up. Right, right now, um, commercial is the east-west route from northbound, and then, you know, the idea is not to make Wick Street feel like it's a large thoroughfare. It needs to feel like a neighborhood street, so we're going to definitely work with the city. Uh, we are also very big proponents of having that on-street parking. Uh, and pedestrian uh, walkways along along Wick Street. The other thing we're going to do is um, at the uh, on Fairmont Avenue. Part of our improvements are to dedicate additional right of way uh, so that you can have on street parking. And also in the uh, at the intersections, we're proposing raised tables so that there's a slight incline when you drive over it. Again, these are all traffic calming measures to bring Fairmont down to 25 miles an hour as it should be. And when people come, at least at this point. Uh, we can only control what's in our, in our neighborhood. But when you're coming southbound on fa uh, uh, Fairmont, when you come to that intersection with Wick, you know you're now in the neighborhood again, and the speed is 25 miles an hour. Hopefully that will be carried through further to the south, but uh, you know, we, we're, we're just controlling what we can here on Fairmont. I'll let John take it from here. Thanks, David. Uh, in this image, this image here, Uh, this shows the uh, uh, exceptional master plan uh, series of interconnected community green spaces. Uh, they include the large white greenhouse lawn space with the pavilion and the children's play area. The center formal muse to the south, and that's modeled on the, the, walking, the walking mall here in downtown. And uh, it's a mixture of hardscape and greenscape. Uh, and there's a gazebo in the center. And it, 
it aligns with the, uh, there's a fountain here that fronts on the Fairmont Avenue. So the idea is to create a, a series of well-designed open spaces that are well-connected and inviting not only to the people who live here, but to, to the res, uh, surrounding neighborhoods, neighbors and residents. Um, next page. Uh, this view is looking east on Fairmont. Excuse me, this is views looking um, north on Fairmont. Um, this section of Fairmont is, is envisioned to be the gateway to Winchester uh, at the north. Uh, the rendering illustrates the goal of making Fairmont a pedestrian friendly uh, street flanked by traditional low scale buildings that emulate the architectural traditions of historic Winchester. And to the right, you can see the gateway described. Uh, right, um, sorry, I'm just messing that up, sorry. Uh, so that's, that's the entryway into the, uh, the community, the, the pedestrian muse there, and is modeled on the, the gateway here in downtown. We found that a very, a very beautiful architecture and very inspiring, so we wanted to bring that into this design. Um, next one. Uh, this view is looking east towards the Central Green and Outdoor Pavilion. Uh, we see this as the heart of the community, with the large, the large green space, the outdoor pavilion where you can have weddings and concerts and even just informal gatherings. Um, and then at the foreground to the left, this is the, a plaza in front of the community uh, a retail area. It's where the leasing office will be. And this, this plaza, or rather the retail in front of the, behind the plaza will have um, a leasing office, a fitness center, um, uh, lounges, game rooms, everything for the community that community needs. Um, next one. Uh, the conceptual design of townhouses follows the residential patterns and details of American classic traditions that define historic Winchester. Uh, so the architecture mixes the roof types and the facade details and allows the neighborhood to have that visual interest and scale that contributes to the desire for a real place. So we're trying to make this feel like Winchester, like, a, like an actual real extension of, of the town that happened gradually or organically over time. Uh, most of the townhouses will have broad garage entries off of rear alleys. A typical garage will accommodate two cars side by side in this configuration with upper level windows and potential and the potential for a balcony that incorporates roof form. So in, in here, some of these garages, uh, there'll be, there's an opportunity for balconies above facing on the back. Um, the next page. It's impressive. Yeah, and so this is basically uh, precedent images of, of architecture that we've done in the past, and this is what we, we hope this, the architecture might look like when it's completed. So this is, uh, g gives you an idea of what will happen, what will take place. Now this is a um, floor plan, uh, a typical 20 foot wide rear loaded townhouse. The ground floor accommodates a two car garage with an entry foyer, a study, powder room, and laundry space. The second floor is the living spaces, and this is the model that has three bedrooms, and two full baths. Um, and how many of those are there? Uh, those three, uh, three, three, three bedrooms. bedrooms? There are 13. 13. Uh, the next one is the, the two bedroom. It's uh, a little bit narrower, it's 18 feet wide, but it has all the same amenities except it's all, it has two bedrooms instead of three upstairs. And this is the, uh, the 16 foot wide townhouse, it could be either rear loaded or front loaded. And because it's more narrow, it just has an entryway on the ground floor. And then it has living spaces above with the, with the laundry um, uses that are typically on the ground floor. And it has a two bedroom up, bedrooms upstairs. Um, the four story apartment buildings that depicted, depicted here are simple and classical in their design with a central entry feature that expresses uh, expression that orients the key views along the site. The rear, excuse me, the rear load of parking reduces the surface parking of the site by employing space within the building footprint. So if you go to the next one, uh, you, you see uh, the back of the building will have uh, tuck under parking. So it gets a lot of the parking under the building and out of parking lots. And the rest of the parking will be in parking lots that are behind the buildings and out of sight. Another thing that uh, is interesting Level, it, activates, it, it activates the whole project like an neighborhood. Um, so that's 
Sorry. No, that's no, great. Um, and basically, in summary, in keeping with the tradition of great cities like Winchester, the master plan will employ a variety of building types, scales, and unit sizes to create a place that has a variety of depth and tradition of a, of a historic neighborhood. Thanks. And then the last slide uh, here just uh, uh, recognizes that uh, we do require the fiscal impact analysis. Um, we've asked, uh, that is the finance director and myself, have asked the applicant to provide a more detailed um, fiscal impact analysis. Anytime you get more than uh, about 50 units, we're expecting something more than a, a three or four page uh, summary. Um, in fairness, uh, Mr. Frank did provide um, you know, the numbers that uh, uh, project the estimated revenues and the estimated expenditures. And uh, as highlighted here, we're looking um, surprisingly low net positive impact, but uh, as highlighted also, uh, they did not uh, attempt to calculate the revenue stream from the non-residential component. And it's a pretty healthy uh, uh, component, I think about uh, uh, just under 10,000 square feet of, uh, well, actually about 15 by the time you include the restaurant and the uh, uh, retail. Uh, and that's in addition to the portion of Building A, uh, that northern building on the east side of uh, Fairmont Avenue that would have the leasing office and the indoor recreational amenities. And uh, in the staff report, I summarize uh, those things. It's uh, you know, things like a fitness center and community room, a small uh, kitchenette area, um, and there'll actually be a mezzanine level within that. So that's why they kind of refer to it as a tall one-story building. It's part of it, I think about 1,300 square feet on the mezzanine level? Uh, yes, yes, all, we're, we're, we're planning about 5,000 square feet of uh, community, in, indoor community uh, uh, space uh, beyond, I guess, the leasing office. We're not including that. Uh, so typically for about 150 unit apartment complex, you know, there's usually like a 1,500 to 2,500 square foot clubhouse of some kind. Uh, this project's proposing 262 units and about 5,000 square feet of, uh, of amenity space. And that's just the space that's inside the, uh, the uh, retail building. There, there might be additional spaces in the final architecture in the apartments. Thank you, David. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I didn't put any slides in here as far as the traffic impact analysis. Um, uh, mainly that's because we knew that this area was already zoned for fairly intensive industrial development. And if you looked at the uh, traffic generation from the by right industrial uses, uh, first of all, you would find that there's going to be a significantly higher percentage of that traffic that would be in the form of truck traffic. And it would probably have less of a peak hour um, uh, factor in terms of uh, those tractor trailers going in and out. The, the reality is while you may not have as much uh, congestion during the afternoon peak hour and, and perhaps a little bit in the uh, morning peak hour, um, you're dealing with uh, uses that operate 24-7. So we feel that uh, the residential uses um, uh, are going to be more compatible with the adjacent residential and also consistent with uh, the city's vision for uh, uh, these redevelopment sites where we want to introduce uh, the residential component as well. Um, lastly, uh, remind the Commission that this is a conditional rezoning, so uh, I want to make note of the uh, uh, voluntary proper statement that was submitted that includes commitments to mitigating stormwater impacts and also mitigating some of the potential uh, uh, safety uh, impacts associated with the current configuration of Wick Street and um, the design of uh, uh, Fairmont Avenue in that, that area there. So I think at this point, I'll turn it over to the commission to uh, ask the panel here uh, any questions that you have. And I'll go back to the uh, one of the uh, development plan uh, illustrations here. Great. Thank you. Appreciate uh, you sitting with us today. Commissioner Wright. I'm impressed by what I've seen. I, I like it. I did see some correspondence that Tim had sent through last week uh, from one of the neighbors asking about the trees. And I guess I thought I understood there was some work and I'm uh, I'm seeing a whole lot more of the woods taken out than I understood looking at the map and that, um, 
and I'm just wondering what you can tell me about uh, protecting the green space. The green spaces where you, you've got the percentage there, but what about the, the wooded area? So, um, so the, like I said, you can always draw a diagonal line across the, uh, the, the project from, from the, the southern corner on Fairmont to the, the Brad Street, Wick Street intersection. Everything to the north of that line is stone existing in part of this area. Um, and, and, and the other areas, uh, I'm not sure what the use was. I believe over time it's grown up. Uh, at one point in time, it, may be, it might, might be pretty hard packed, but there are definitely some trees in there. Um, we can't save, you know, with this with this kind of project, we're not going to save all, all the everything in there. But we do recognize that that boundary between uh, the residents of Bradley Street and our development may have some significant uh, some significant trees. Uh, so, yeah. So we're you know we're we're committed to taking a look at those trees and actually documenting what's there, uh, and also you know uh, replanting you know some buffer. Is there, I mean, I've seen in Tim, we've talked about a certain type of tree. Is there a definition of what uh, kind of tree we'd be having in that buffer? Or what? Yeah, so the, um, so far the developers just indicated that there would be a, uh, an evergreen tree, a single row. I probably will suggest that uh, they seek the input from the arborist as far as which existing mature, uh, particularly large deciduous trees are worth saving. Obviously, don't want to cut those down, uh, nor do you necessarily want to plant an evergreen right at the base of those. <laughs> do well, so there's going to have to be some uh, variation in terms of that uh, newly introduced evergreen screen uh, to account for uh, where trees are preserved. You can see in this diagram they're they're effectively barricading themselves off from the uh, uh, the access that they have out to Braddock Street. Uh, in their original proposal that, um, that was presented at that a April um, neighborhood uh, input meeting, they had a walkway there, and, I, and staff is very supportive of that uh, as far as tying in uh, new residential neighborhoods to existing ones. But uh, we had at least one person quite vocal about not wanting that. Uh, and I think the comment was made because they feared that these new residents would walk over there and park their cars on North Braddock Street instead of uh, in their own garages or uh, parking areas on this site. Um, but you saw the, the comparison of the parking that's, uh, you know, almost 500 spaces where only 333 are required. So they're not skimping on their uh, parking. One of the things I can, I can address the landscaping and conceptually we're, we're committing to screening. Um, I do not want you know, the commission to think that we're proposing to pick a single tree and plant it 752 times. Um, you know, typically, you know, once you have more than 20, if you're going to do a mass planting, you don't want a particular species to be more than 20% anyway. So variety is the key. Uh, there's an attractiveness that can be that can be done here. Uh, we don't know where exactly some quality trees are that we would save, um, and and then you know, the, there there has to be a commitment to early go and reprune, try to save the trees so that they're not by construction. Uh, there's a whole process here. Uh, we're committed to making that, that, that buffer between the two pro uh, existing properties in our project be uh, as, as attractive and as, as healthy as we can make it. So and the, uh, in the calculation I saw that the uh, stormwater detention ponds were included in the area for green space. Is that typically how we count green space? Yes, yes, those are, those are always counted into the green space as long as they are you know, pervious areas. It's not a concrete uh, basin or reservoir yeah. or something. All right. Um, thank you. Well, I've got a scattering here, um, but I guess I'll just start there along those lines. Uh, actually, Mr. Human, do you know of any, uh, I know from that initial community meeting, the residents on Braddock Street in particular were concerned about a variety of issues, the closeness and the parking. Um, do you know of any similar, in particular, they don't have any off-street parking in those residents, and so that's, I think, what perhaps led to a trigger effect of concerns about parking and perhaps closing that walkway. Uh, do we have any comparisons of similar developments where the impact on neighboring single-family residents who don't have off-street parking might be <clears throat> known? Essentially, would those residents perhaps not be able to park in front of their house, uh, roughly, it, based on any other 
past history we have? Um, well, of course, some, some of them do have some off street parking. Enough, yeah. um, the multifamily uh, uh, building that's uh, there on the west side, they have kind of the whole front yard as a parking lot. Um, but um, probably outside of the existing Old Town area, I would say I, I can't think of any. Uh, most of the PUDs have gone in adjacent areas where uh, there's other n newer development and, and they, the neighbors already have their off street parking. Would there be, I know in certain areas of the city, there's some sort of resident sticker. Um, is that mm -hmm. triggered in any way? Um, but that, that is an option if the uh, North Braddock Street neighborhood uh, feels that there's uh, uh, too much uh, parking uh, demand uh, from outside their neighborhood, then uh, they could certainly do what the, the neighborhoods out around the old hospital did, in behind Hanley Library, and even down on Jefferson Street. Uh, between Valley Avenue and uh, I think all the way up to Courtfield mm -hmm. um, Avenue. And that can be done even once sort of the impact is seen and is, or is it something that needs to be done early? They could do it at any point. Yeah. So you can kind of yeah. be flexible. I would just, uh, um, if, if the decision to change that uh, walkway was based just off of perhaps one comment, I would at least be more open, I think, to consider perhaps changing that. If, if thus there's more to it, perhaps. Uh, I mean, I can be quite frank about it and say we would love the Planning Commission to recommend that connection be reestablished. Uh, we would love to put it back in, but we're not looking to pick any fights with, with the folks on Braddock Street. And uh, we're also, we have three units from Braddock Street. That's not a lot, but uh, we, we told the citizens we are, we're, we'd fully support any kind of parking measure that they, they, they want to do. Uh, and they can do that today if they want to. Okay. And, uh, I was just going to say uh, to, to kind of build on, on why to do that. Um, you know, the uh, the applicant has emphasized wanting to kind of create a, a kind of an organic uh, development right. that looks like it, it fits with the development. So, if I were over on North Braddock Street, I don't know why I wouldn't want to have an easy way to get what you see on the screen there, or to get to some of their yeah. uh, newly introduced restaurant commercial use over on Braddock uh, on Fairmont Avenue. So just to stress, all that space is meant to be used by yes. the folks who already live in those neighborhoods. Um, and then, so the other concern I know often of those same residents was the other side, the, the buffer side. Is there, could you talk about the timing of when those decisions will be made, when they might know exactly, you know, I'm sure for a lot of those folks, it's 15 yards from the back of their house and they wonder how much, how tall are these trees? How in the, how far in the process are those decisions actually made? Will they be able to know what the impact will be on them. It's it's going to take time to do a right. full study. Um, I think I think anecdotally, you can probably look if you see a if you see an eight foot cedar tree or you know a, a dying red bud. Uh, those are not trees that are going to get saved. Um, but if you see a nice oak tree in your backyard, uh, that will probably be identified as a tree we want to save. Um, and, uh, and again, we, it's going to be it's going to be some time for arborists to come out and take a look at that, uh, and I don't have I don't have an exact date for you right now. I'm not sure. Gonna, I'm going to try to have a date for you by the, uh, the public hearing. But that will be somewhat early in this process as this goes along. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, as we always say, this is the rezoning step, uh, right. and there would be a required site plan that wouldn't necessarily be a public hearing, but we would certainly. Uh, uh, that is, city staff would bring that back to the commission for authorizing administrative approval. Um, however, there have been uh, PUDs, like I'm thinking of Meadow Branch uh, Phase 2, the southern, uh, more recent one that's under construction, where the residents along the north side of Buckner uh, Drive felt it was a significant impact arising from that rezoning and the uh, the applicant provided a fairly detailed plan of the tree preservation as well as new tree planting so that's not out of the order for the commission and council to say it's an unmitigated impact and should be addressed somehow gotcha. if i could just yeah please i gotta find my next question here. good thank you let me just don't take the space <laughs> i think what i heard is you say is that you're going to go through the property before you clear the site for construction to assess all the trees that are there along the perimeters obviously yeah, in the yeah. center of the project it's it's complete uh, redesign yeah. okay got it with the i understand with the traffic we're often we're not comparing it to what's there now which is nothing but what essentially could be there 
is there any um, or how much do we look at how the traffic connects to other big developments that are going on right now? Essentially, this is probably going to empty up into, a, you know, the other very large development there on, you know, and I'm just wondering, you know, some of these are pretty close where if we're just looking at sort of impacts in isolation, is there a way we can sort of understand how these big projects at once might impact each other? I, I, it's a broad question, but. Uh, yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to let David talk about how they uh, determine the uh, you know future traffic in terms of background growth, which would be those other okay. developments versus what arises from their project specifically. So essentially, with the traffic, uh, this is the you know, Tim. Tim hit the made the key point already. Uh, the type of vehicle, the vehicles that you'll see are going to be cars and not trucks. Uh, this is also going to have a very predictable peak hour uh, at the morning. Uh, traffic is, is a significantly less. It's about 60%, 65% of the evening being traffic, and that's just simply because there is a commercial component to this project on Fairmont. Uh, we're looking at about 220 uh, p.m. peak hour trips uh, as a result of this project. Uh, we see we see a large split of the residential coming off of Wick, uh, but then there's also some of the commercial uh, on Fairmont. So, so essentially, you know, the, the increased trips and the mitigation of the traffic calming improvements uh, and the improvements in the definition of the road, if you will, on WIC. Uh, also, uh, we discussed uh, with the residents and the city staff um, looking at possibly making some improvements at the Braddock Street WIC intersection. Right now, uh, many years ago, that was the primary north-south. Uh, route so the turning movements there are meant to have big trucks uh, clear. So if you think about if you look at that intersection, it's actually pretty wide. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but uh, so these are all the, these improvements are things that we're mitigating. Um, and and the, again, the, the, the number of trips and what the comp plan is looking for here, uh, we feel this is a very reasonable level of service and also providing a lot of access for residents to come in and out of the community. If you want to make right turns, you can get north and south, um, you know, easy. And just one more for now. Uh, the, it's no, now no phasing is planned, right? So hopefully that so right now it's set to go all at once? Correct, correct. It, with this on the city side, is there any, you know, if, of course, if this does go through, of course, we would hope that construction is successful. It seems it's a very large project. Is there any concerns if something stalls on their end that the city would be how we're integrating that with the stormwater issue? If, if worst case, you know, there's this is a, there's a stall here. How much can yeah? It's a it's an excellent question, and and we always advise developers of these larger PUDs to identify a pacing plan because invariably they get to a certain point. Um, and they say, well, how can you tell us we can't get an occupancy permit on a building that's been fully approved by the building department? And we remind them that back when you did your rezoning, we begged you to do a phasing plan. You said, oh, no, it's all coming online at once. Um, but in regard to things like stormwater utilities, uh, the amenities, we would call for all of those things to be in the first phase of development. Um, uh, or if they're not all going to be in the first phase, then to clearly show which amenities and which infrastructure uh, projects aren't associated with that. Commissioner Mayfield. Um, I had a few questions too. If you can go back to the resilient um, So just a couple of questions. I, well, I should begin and say I'm very impressed and pleased. This looks like it could be a very wonderful asset as a community for Winchester, and I'm very excited about it. Um, and, but I have questions. Um, so the M1, this is a significant chunk of the limited industrial going away for the city. And while um, you know it's not the most attractive to look at, and when you look at the aerial, it's not even all that full. It's just a lot of asphalt. It is a lot of trucks. Um, in other words, where does this use or function go? Um, or it's just part of the White House plant that is shutting down, and we do not need a need. We don't have a need for it. 
is there elsewhere in the city if we had a demand for a limited industrial for, for it to go? It's a good question. Um, you know, the adopted comprehensive plan, um, the most recent one as well as the one prior to that, identified um, all of the national fruit property as a, a, a redevelopment site. Okay. The west side there. Good. And all of that is being preserved for industrial development and they have expansion capability there. Okay. Although some of the land zoned industrial kind of goes up steeply in the back. Um, but I think the fact that National Fruit isn't utilizing any of the, the land there on the east side of Fairmont Avenue uh, for anything other than a place of worship use, right. that kind of speaks to, it's ready um, to go. You know, the future of it, the viability of it for industrial. And quite honestly, um, you know, some of, uh, I, I did not realize, for instance, uh, thanks for bringing the, the thing. One of the thing you'll notice here is that we're gonna have two little remnants. That's the, my next question. Yeah. Um, can we tidy up the plan? Um, we can't force <laughs> this developer to uh, 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 force uh, uh, an adjacent property owner to rezone <laughs> at the same time, but I think we'll be coming back to you with a city-sponsored land rezoning to change those to some kind of residential designation. Are the, those are just kind of leftover single family residential that just got stuck in M1 or M1 got overlaid on top of them and yeah I, I think way back when uh, you know predecessor owners of uh, uh, National Fruit probably bought up the houses and asked City Council to zone them industrial so that they wouldn't have to um, you know go through a controversial rezoning process uh, later on okay. But uh, yeah, that is that is one anomaly that will result uh, after you take the, the larger M1 district and and uh, carve out all of those two. Uh, actually, it's three separate lots: two on the east side and one on the west side. Right. And are they vacant right now, or is it no? Uh, I think they're all they're, occupied. They're all occupied. Yeah. And but they're occupied as single-family detached residences. They really have they little of any value. Them. They're too LR. small to be a viable industrial property on their own anyway. Um, and then looking at the um, lesser design, the overall neighborhood conceptual master plan. Yeah, yeah that one. Um, so there was some discussion about uh, a project of this size stalling and phasing. Um, I was happy to hear that the stormwater management would be a part of phase one. Um, what was the timeline that the city had in mind for executing that stormwater management? project and would the developer be prepared to with that with that timeline so it is in the CIP the council adopted I do not recall how soon the engineering uh, is to commence but that's the first step in that process now that uh, the developer is, is uh, incorporating this into their project uh, that will accelerate that time frame for planning it out uh, but in terms of construction I I don't want to speak out of line. Uh, manager, do you want to say anything in that regard? Off the top of my head, I don't know. Anything. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. But it was in the CIP, yeah. so it's sometime in the next five years. And, it, well, and I think they indicated this development will probably move that, all that moves up. So this is okay. before we were planning to do it. So that gives you an indication, but I don't know the exact year off the top of my head. Okay. Um, and then along those lines too, what is the, I can't remember, is there a deadline with a CUP for a start? We've, I feel like this question has come up in other projects. Is it one year? It's one year, not to necessarily start construction, but to submit the first um, site plan. So if this is a okay. single project, they have to add the site plan for okay. the whole development in within one year of council adoption. Of the okay. Because. Um, I mean, the, this is wonderful looking, but it looks very schematic, and that seems like a tight timeline. So well, this is the, sure. the same entity that's pushing this project is the one that didn't get that done with the Linden Drive project, so I think they'll be very sensitive to that time. Okay, yeah. great. I and can also speak to that briefly. Yeah, sure. Uh, again, with the, with the size that's only being a 10-acre parcel and with the, with the product being what it is with a lot of rental units, um, when you kick this off, you do all the infrastructure at one time. So the idea that you would do, you know, all the improvements on Wick Street and the north half of the property and somehow not do all of it at one time uh, is, is not really, you know, mm -hmm. a smart move. So right. we would be moving into a site plan pretty quickly, pretty quickly. again, to ensure that uh, 
and what this project is trying to achieve and what the city is trying to achieve is all happening in the right way. Okay. And then I had a couple more questions. Please. But, um, my, a couple programmatic questions. Um, are there any homeowner uh, owned properties on this? Are the townhomes homeowner or are they rented? The project was originally going to be 100% rental, but what you can take a look at now is there are a series of townhouses that are fronting Fairmont and also Wick and Braddock. Mm -hmm. Those will be uh, fee simple lots. Those are going to not be you know, part of the overall uh, uh, sun uh, uh, apartment uh, area. So, I, and I don't want to speak, but I think it's 32 mm -hmm. townhouses. It's essentially all the units along front of the long streets. Okay. Could be homeowners. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's great. Um, and when you say 5% are affordable, I guess when it's a home ownership, it's harder to control. When you mean 5%, that would be apartments, that would be rental units, not home It owned. would be, yes. So we anticipate that being, uh, that we have four apartment buildings, and then we have, I believe, nine. This is how I count, calculate out uh, uh, of the uh, affordable housing. Right. And okay. then those would be typically you try to distribute those, so really no one knows which one is the affordable right. They just be scattered. Um, so we kind of we expect to see two in each building, probably three in the larger one. But that doesn't necessarily mean that at some point, you know, ten years from now, you have four in one building, one in another. Uh, they would just rotate as one unit becomes available, the next person in line get the next okay. unit. Okay. Great. And be rented at that rate. Okay. Um, that seems really fair. Um, and. I think one issue with building two, I'm having trouble reading, is it four stories or five? It's, uh, so I will, I'll admit to that, the development plan is incorrect. They're all four story buildings, okay. they're five. One point in time, there were gonna be five story buildings, mm -hmm. uh, but the development team backed, backed off from that. And okay. Because I think that central building would be an opportunity for another story, more units, um, just it, doesn't. It would, but I think uh, there's a point there's a point where it's too much. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so we've, we've recognized that this is a, you know, it was about creating a neighborhood, not right. just squeezing as much Dollars. as dollars. Yeah. And then the blue buildings that are on the north side of the Muse and the south side of Apple Blossom Drive, I'm having difficulty understanding what they are. So the blue ones, these right here, are also yeah. townhouses. They're townhouses. So essentially what you have is the, uh, the tan ones are the 16 foot wide units, the blue ones are the 18 foot wides, and the Oh, okay. Lines. And so where are those folks parking? They are parking they under building garages, two. They have garages, so this is probably the best place to zoom. The folks here on the alley have a two-car garage uh, without a driveway. So let's say those are these, these so do something. So these folks here do uh, have a two-car garage accessed by an Oh, alley. okay. And these folks here have uh, a, a driveway, driveway and a two-car garage. Okay. Um, again, their, their, their front door faces outward, and the alley is where the uh, parking is in the rear. Um, you know, and, and typically, you can see here what as well. The, the front of the unit will be facing Wick, and uh, the garage units will be in the rear. That was all my questions. Thank you for the time. Good. Thank you. Um, just a couple questions. One, in regards to building one, um, as far as having that four-story building um, going down Fairmount Avenue, do you all see any issue with the, like a tunnel effect um, with that building being four stories and only set back off of Fairmount Avenue by, what, 15, 20 feet? So, so uh, on day one, Considering it's just open space right now, it's gonna it's gonna seem seem that way. But also, uh, what we're doing is we're creating a neighborhood and creating a street presence. And we're gonna have the uh, on street parking, uh, and we're trying to create a streetscape. Uh, so so we believe that it's it's actually going to be nice and on a pedestrian level. You're gonna have so much going on the ground floor on the, on the <coughs> pedestrian level on the, the lowest level um, that that's that creating that streetscape. And if Go back to our plan. Um, you, know, you know, it's one of the reasons why we've we've, uh, we've, we've got the retail buildings up, up on the street, and as well the townhouse units on either side of the apartments. Uh, again, uh, you know, we, 
we think the difference between a three story and a four story, if you're at the street level, you're not going to notice. Uh, you know, not going to notice it that much. Coming from coming from the north, it's going to step up. Um, you know, as as you as you approach, you'll have the retail, and then you'll have the three story towns, and then you have the four story apartments tucked in. Um, so the facades will be screened by the townhouses as you're coming from the north and south. Uh, so the signs, I should say, will be, will be screened with seeing the actual townhouse facades. What's the setback from the from the four story apartment complex to Fairmont? We are we have a ten foot setback on our architecture on Fairmont. Now we're dedicating additional right of way as well so that we can fit the streets, the sidewalks, the on street parking, all that in there as well. So. The right of way will be wider than what it is today, um, but again, we're, we're creating travel lanes, parking, and a pedestrian space um, um, behind the cars. And then, how tall are the retail, restaurant, business, commercial space? So, the, the, the restaurant is just a single use, uh, that'll be some sort of how tall? Like, is it oh, that story? Be one story, uh, yeah. One story, perhaps a tall one story, okay. uh, depending on the architecture. Um, uh, Anthony, if we were here, uh, he would speak to the uh, the style of that building, just because of the shape, the point, what's happening with the rail. Uh, they see trying to mimic some sort of old train station style architecture, something that seemed like it might have been appropriate or actually have been left over uh, from in the city streetscape. Um, and then the retail building, um, Essentially, the, the northern piece is going to be commercial neighborhood retail, and the southern piece is going to be the leasing office and amenity space. And that is also going to be a tall one story. We don't see that being two story um, at this time. Gotcha. As far as the city's side, would it be um, would it behoove them to do like a four way stop, whether it's at the Apple Blossom Drive or Wick Street, or or have a lighted intersection there? Um, all that's going to come down to warrants. Uh, we sent the traffic impact analysis off to Mr. Eisenach uh, about a month and a half ago, so he's uh, he's uh, presumably reviewed the uh, thing. I'll, I'll check with him prior to the public hearing in two weeks. But um, uh, Mr. Frank mentioned the 200 uh, vehicles. I think uh, peak hour in the development. Uh, if you think about that, uh, spread out over 60 minutes. That's not much more than three vehicles per minute and just during that peak hour and that's the total that's all access points or just the that's, uh, that's, that's all access yeah points. so that's not really a very detectable increase in traffic from what's already there um, if you think about it uh, they're seeing maybe one and a half more vehicles a minute on those streets that already have uh, you know a lot more capacity uh, than what's already on the streets here, I, I would argue that most people won't even detect the difference. I, I, can, I can say that um, we're going to work closely with Public Works and Mr. Eisenhower uh, on Fairmont and on Wick Street improvements. Uh, and I would be surprised, and, you know, I could say that I'd be surprised if there were any warrants for a, a signalization, you know, at, this, uh, at any of these intersections. To an additional stop sign. But again, this is all about traffic calming, and if the city finds it appropriate to put a stop sign at one of these intersections, uh, absolutely, we don't have a problem with it. Because, you know, again, we see this as a neighborhood, not industrial. Gotcha. And just to confirm, um, the four story buildings do include that includes parking on the main floor, on the main level, is that correct? In the rear of the main level, that's correct. Okay. Yes. Anything else, Brian? John? Yeah, just a couple questions. You get a lot of intersections inside the, uh, the complex. I'm just curious, what's your traffic flow? How are you going to control traffic within the complex? Stop signs, kill signs. Uh, stop signs, most likely. Yes. Of course, you know, the other thing, man, the stormwater uh, system. Are you going to have it in the stormwater management complex? Will that be fenced in, or uh, just from a safety standpoint? Um, it, it, we're, we're going to try to design something that does not need to be fenced in. This goes back to my point earlier. Uh, we recognize there's a functionality to what we have to do with stormwater. Uh, uh, there's a heavier component 
uh, that the city has going on uh, in this area. Uh, from our project, quite frankly, will not. If you just do, do the simple math, if you have 50% green space and you have 50% impervious currently, we're actually not going to be generating that much more runoff from this site once it's developed. Uh, it's going to be comparable, but uh, incorporating our stormwater management and our water quality uh, impacts with the city's design is what's going to be key. And lastly, uh, illuminating the, the church. Have we any contact with the uh, church about what's happening, losing their meeting facility? Not to my knowledge, there are the tenant, uh, the I know, owner, I know. owner is the one requesting their yeah. zoning. So no contact with any, I don't know, at the uh, committee meeting, nobody brought it up. So I was just curious if anybody from my church had made contact with you. Uh, no, no direct contact, uh, but again, they allowed us to use the space to present the plan to the neighborhood, so they're not in the dark on what's going on. They're fully informed. Anyway, thanks for coming. It was very nice. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks. Um, I agree with everyone. It's beautiful. And I really appreciate the thoughtfulness around incorporating it with our downtown and, and how wonderful that seems to flow. I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, and uh, most of my questions were, were answered. I think you mentioned that there could be some home, or there would be some home, home ownership with the townhouses. Um, would they have? Um, access to the amenities as well? Yes. This, okay. this project, it's gonna, they're going to have to put together some sort of complicated POA, HOA. Yeah. Um, but yes, it, uh, the whole property is going to be covered. Uh, neither the homeowners nor the renters want the other entity to drag them down. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And the last is I did read a piece in here. Is, are you thinking about 30 school children might come out of this project? Uh, yes. I think it's a very conservative number. We think that's high. Uh, but in terms of you know, generating fiscal impact, uh, again, we, we looked at it conservatively. We, we used uh, a cheaper value to an evaluation of the car than other uh, recent uh, uh, fiscal impact studies have. You know, I think we were around 12000 at the city average, where other studies estimated a $15,000 mm -hmm. fiscal impact. Um, you know, we're, we're estimating with, with only 13 three-bedroom units on a 262, you know, the, the, the .08, these students is, is, is very at the high end of what the apartments generate. So um, we feel pretty strong that we'll be doing more than that. Okay, great, thank you. That, that's a great question. If I could just follow up, so you mean, could we just make sure the superintendent is made aware of the project? Uh, we certainly can. I, I, I think the 30 or 34, whatever that number was, was extremely high for a project that only has 13. Uh, three bedroom townhouses. I, I don't think it's going to be anywhere near 30 children generated. Nevertheless, it's always good to, uh, to inform. Uh, I appreciate everyone's questions, and I've got, uh, I've got a few more. The three townhouses that are on Braddock, I, I can't tell from the, from the schematic whether or not they are in line, generally in line with the houses that are on Braddock, or are they closer to the street than the houses currently on Braddock? Do you follow my question? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna squint a little bit too and say they're generally on line in line with the houses. Um, they may be a hair closer, um, but uh, they're we're consistent with what we were doing on uh, Wake and with uh, Fairmont, and you know again that's an adjustment. Right, but it's the view as you drive north on Braddock. They should generally not stick out. Yeah. So that's an adjustment we could make as well. Take, take, as take we a look at how forward. generally it's presented as you drive north on Braddock. Thank you. Mr. Yemens, are there any rules for standoff from rail lines or industrial areas that we have to be concerned about? Or do you think we're okay the way this is presented? For, for rail lines? For rail lines and industrial areas. I'm not aware of any uh, standards that we have in our local ordinance or uh, other state or federal ones. It's, it's not an active rail line through there. Did it? Well, they've, they've abandoned the uh, portion to the west that runs yeah. behind the restaurant and uh, further down there. So um, I, don't, I don't even think a uh, 
a train could operate on some of that rail anymore. Okay. I don't think we've mentioned it, but all the roads internal to the development are private roads? Correct. No, that's good. Any other ones? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> yep, we, we're moving on, John. We'll move to RT-22-275 and, and ordinance to rezone 2.59 acres at 1570 Commercial Street for Commercial Industrial CM1 District to Medium Density Residential District with a plan unit development. Mr. Stewart. Oh, let me let me digress just for a moment. Uh, whoever, whichever commissioner goes to the next county meeting, I, I would ask you to emphasize this particular project we just talked about because the county line is just a few hundred feet up the road. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. I have uh, Chris Miller from Greenway Engineering here as well uh, to co-present uh, this, uh, this application. Uh, this is the second time uh, we've looked at it. Um, I will uh, give an update to the uh, Planning Commission on uh, some of the changes and uh, uh, a brief uh, overview again of the uh, project. It's a 2.59 acre site on Commerce Street at 1570 Commerce Street where the proposal is to go from a CM1 zoning to an MR zoning with a PUD overlay. The uh, development plan uh, has stayed consistent from uh, first version to the most recent version with 32, um, 32 units. They are looking at um, 24 multifamily um, units and eight uh, townhome uh, units. The revised uh, May 27th development plan was submitted and I'll let Chris uh, explain a little bit more of the uh, uh, changes but essentially they have reduced um, the number of off-street parking spaces from 48 to 34 so they've, they've removed 34 um, off-street parking spaces from the site and uh, redesigned one of the um, excuse me, they redesigned the dumpster pad location to not face directly out uh, to Commerce Street. And uh, significantly, they have, the applica applicant has submitted new architectural renderings that um, review um, or kind of acknowledge uh, some of the concerns and comments at Planning Commission um, in May. Uh, the new renderings are in your packet and they are uh, I'm showing them on the screen right now, but the uh, fundamentals uh, of the of the project are, are uh, st have stayed the same. Um, so, if uh, Chris would like to uh, kind of detail more some of the changes that have been proposed. Sure. Thank you, David. Uh, you know, they're really. Um, I think you've kind of hit the, the high points, but um, there I'll just. Uh, just reemphasize some of the uh, site changes. Um, you know, initially uh, we were over over parked, if you will. Uh, so the off street area, we did cut out 14 of those parking spaces. Uh, so for from an off street perspective, it averages out to about 1.4 uh, spaces per unit. So we're still a little bit above what the ordinance requires, which is one. Uh, that was space. the question: whether or not you meet the requirement. We do. Yep. And uh, you know, I, I think as a as a anticipated rental community, you know, of course, we are sensitive to the fact that, you know, in many cases there will be two, uh, you know, tenants potentially. Uh, so in, coupled with the on the on street parking, we are averaging out at about two spaces per unit with that. So uh, there's some flexibility there, which we felt was still important. Um, the good news with uh, reducing the parking, of course, it allowed us to increase uh, some of the usable open space on the site. And uh, what you'll see uh, in general is the um, is the central green amenity area. Uh, previously, you know, it had been a more or less right up to the edges uh, of the parking area. Uh, with the reduction in parking, we were able to expand some of that open space green area to the sides, uh, which gives a little bit more flexibility for the use of that space. Uh, as well and of course this had been shared with you I think uh, prior to the last meeting uh, but we did detail out uh, that hardscape area a bit more so 
both uh, gave us the ability to refine our open space calculation, but also give a little better picture of how the space would be utilized uh, for tenants there. So uh, all in all, I think some of these changes based on the comments that were provided uh, through staff and the commission, you know, I think have definitely improved uh, the site layout. In my and so mind. you met the green space requirements. Absolutely. Too. We're at, you know, we're, we were at, you know, we were above it. Uh, but uh, even with calculating out some of the uh, hardscape, we still stayed above. So we're at 48% uh, for the open space. Right. Yep. And uh, just to kind of, well, let me see if there's anything else I really wanted to touch on here. Uh, that was really the, those are the high points. Uh, and just to touch on the, uh, the elevations, of course, the, uh, this is an image of the uh, apartment building, uh, the two apartment buildings that are, are planned. And you'll see it is a, a mix of, um, of masonry uh, along the lower level. And then we have you know, both horizontal and vertical uh, types of siding to help break up uh, the, uh, the, the feel of the, of the facade. And of course, changes in the color scheme as well from you know, a gray to a white and a, a darker blue uh, as well would be involved. Uh, with that, so we do have a mix of, of, uh, of materials and, um, and treatments, if you will, which is a, an improvement. Uh, also, of course, one of the things that we heard uh, clearly uh, was that the side facade facing Commerce Street in particular uh, needed to have a, a lot more interest uh, visually. Uh, so this both uh, carries along that same treatment from the, the primary and, facade and windows. and windows. So we also have street facing windows uh, with uh, with that and we maintain of course the uh, lower level uh, or kind of knee wall of, of masonry treatment along the side as well and uh, for both the uh, apartment buildings and for the townhouse buildings uh, we will have foundation plantings uh, for the facades facing uh, commerce street oh and there are the there are the townhomes thank you that was great um, so the townhomes also a uh, very similar uh, situation where the sides were the were the concern uh, the front facades and rear facades have not changed uh, in this case, but the side, uh, we did add, um, you know, a larger window opening, uh, so there are multiple window openings, and also continued that knee wall of, uh, of masonry along the edge as well. Uh, so, uh, again, these changes were in an effort to be responsive uh, to these uh, design concerns. And on the, if I may just jump in here. Do the side window additions, David, meet the requirements? They certainly are, are an improvement from the first designs. And uh, we, we did look uh, at a staff level, we reviewed the floor plans in depth, and there is potential for additional windows on these facades if, if Planning Commission or City Council um, truly felt that that was necessary uh, to improve the kind of design aesthetic of it. Uh, there might be an opportunity in the uh, bedrooms there to add a new, uh, uh, maybe a, like two new rows of windows, uh, kind of doubling the number of windows, but uh, that's if, if Planning Commission or City Council feels that that's a, a necessary improvement. So is that yes, we minimally meet the, the mark, yes. or, but it could be better? Could always be better. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to be clear, thank you, go ahead. Sure. Uh, really, that's uh, that's that's all that I have in terms of updates. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. Start over here this time. Um, just one nitpicky item: what's it, the in, improved site plan in our packet did not match what's on the screen. Uh, let's see. We did include. Oh, there's the December twenty seventh uh, version of the yes. comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you. In the presentation, we do have the uh, previous submittals if you'd like yes. to see how they've evolved. But, okay. um, no, it's looking good. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner? Nothing over there. Commissioner, the uh, first floor windows, they look into a bedroom. There's a sidewalk, is there a sidewalk in front of it? The people are looking inside of a bedroom? I don't believe they're looking inside of a bedroom. Uh, that's a I believe that's the, I, want to say. I believe that's the bathroom. Yeah, they we might even better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks inside of a bathroom. I believe that is. Uh, <laughs> I believe those are. Um, yeah, those are the floor plans, which I don't have in the presentation. They are in the packet. Floor plans are in the packet. Floor plan garden. Yeah, it is. Uh, those are uh, uh, bathroom windows. Even better. Yeah, in that location. On the first floor. 
down. Oh, good too. We, we've actually seen this three times, and so we'll, we'll uh, game starts two weeks. Uh, Sounds good. We'll see if any other windows pop in. There we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the revisit. Any otherwise? I'd like to remind the uh, planning commission process wise, the public hearing was open and closed at the last. Uh, so I'll have to open it again. Um, yeah. We can't open it again because it was um, advertised at that meeting. Um, and uh, I, well, I can double check the record and see if we. Yeah, I, I thought open. the discussion was if we close it, we'll have to advertise it. That is true. Yes. So yeah, that's what it, we should do. And it was closed, but you can you can allow people to speak under public comments. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. We should have a lot of people to speak. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to committee reports. Who went the last county meeting? I did. It was short and sweet. So they had um, a CUP for a boarding, not a boarding facility, excuse me, a dog training facility in Brown County that was tabled because it wasn't, um, the public hearing wasn't, the signs weren't up correctly. So. Um, that will I'll hear that again on the 15th um, and then they walked through their transportation plan for Frederick County so going through I-81 enhancements as well as you know some of the secondary roads that they're going to be um, hard surfacing so that was very interesting and that was it status of projects pending council approval the Text amendment for the outdoor dining that was privately sponsored by Ron McGee. He was approved by council oh, as great. submitted, so that's been approved. Good, thank you. And the only thing I have at council on the 14th is the reapproval of the Linden Drive PUD that didn't make it onto the agenda for the last meeting of May, so it's been advertised for next Tuesday. And how did the PED respond to that? I mean, PED uh, supported the project. Uh, oh, and big announcement on that. Um, you recall that there were going to be um, 13 two-unit townhouses out along Linden Drive. Just uh, three days ago, three business days ago, the applicant submitted a revised development plan that now shows instead of 26 townhouse units there in, in you know, two in each of 13 buildings, they're now going to do 18 single-family detached homes there. So the neighbors across the street will be thrilled and staff is thrilled too. I know they're allowed to change things dramatically after we see it. Uh, so thank you for keeping us updated when they do change things dramatically after we see it. <laughs> I'm looking at housing. Are the driveways going to be all uh, coming out on Linda Drive? Yeah. So like any other single family detached house, they'll have a two car garage and uh, you know a driveway wide enough to support two cars in the driveway in addition to two in the house. So that's as good as all, any of the houses across the way. Mr. Humans, remind me again, is that, are they all rentals? So will those No, the, those, uh, those houses be? are on separately platted lots, yeah, so uh, okay. most of the upper terrace, in fact, all of the upper terrace units, townhouses and single families, can be offered for sale. Great. That's that is and, and did the pit cause that change to happen, or did they just wake up and change it? Um, we kept dinging them about, uh, we meaning staff, kept dinging them about wanting to see uh, a front elevation that didn't look like a garage with a house mm -hmm. uh, on top of it, yeah. and uh, Dan Ryan Builders finally gave up and said, "We can't, we can't figure it out. We're just going to do 18 single families." So. Good, thank you. That's that's good enough. Appreciate the update. Uh, any discussion for the good of the order? Going once. That's all we need to go. We're adjourned. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.